And Earth's crust may not have been the only place where life could have hidden from the heavy bombardment. Another safe haven may have been the ocean. Volcanic activity was intense on the early Earth. Chemicals from deep inside the planet spewed into the primitive seas. Even today, marine biologists have discovered volcanic vents on the ocean floor. Despite scalding temperatures, acid eruptions, and total lack of sunlight, they found creatures of all types thriving down here. And at the bottom of the food chain are microbes that live on the noxious hydrogen sulfide gas erupting from the vents. On early Earth, primitive life may have survived in similar environments. If all of the bombardment was occurring near the surface, survivors would be existing in just these kinds of hydrothermal vent communities where there's abundant water and nutrients and heat and food in the form of chemical energy. It has been found that organisms collected there nowadays are genetically kin to some of the earliest organisms that we think existed on the Earth. By about three and a half billion years ago, or five o'clock in the morning on our 24-hour clock, the bombardment of asteroids and comets had ceased. With far fewer violent impacts on Earth, microbial life could now survive outside its protective hiding places. After it reaches Earth's surface, life would take advantage of another source of energy, the sun. Up here, microbes evolved a green pigment known as chlorophyll. This allowed them to trap sunlight and use it to drive a chemical reaction that converts carbon dioxide and water into food. Called photosynthesis, it was a clever invention that enabled some bacteria to grow and reproduce almost without limit. Once it started, photosynthesis was a runaway success. And today, it's how all green plants make their living. As Earth cooled, this new generation of cells spread across the oceans. Immense colonies of green slime would take over the world, kicking off the greatest transformation in our planet's history. Photosynthesis is the great liberator of, of biology. With photosynthesis, the energy is coming from the sun, and life could spread literally over the entire planetary surface. And this remote corner of Western Australia holds clues to how that happened. These domed structures called stromatolites are built up layer over thousands of years by tiny microbes. These microbes may be similar to life forms that dominated our planet billions of years earlier. And in the arid hills nearby, there may be evidence of these ancient creatures. These rocks have remained unchanged for three and a half billion years. Here, it's possible to walk on the surface of early Earth. Martin Van Cronendunk spends months at a time in this wilderness, studying the geology and producing maps. In a secret location in these hills is what could be one of the greatest geological discoveries of all time. These are the oldest fossils in the world at about three and a half billion years old. And they're composed of stromatolites. 
And at this outcrop, we can see two different types of structures that these creatures formed. First are these black mats that have wrinkly textures all through it. And the second are these larger domes that form these broad structures. The most likely way these things formed is by the growth of microbes. Like modern stromatolites, these ancient structures could also have been built by colonies of bacteria. And not far away are fossilized ripple marks, which suggest they might have grown in shallow water. And here you can see we've got a smaller structure that we call the Mickey Mouse ears, which is this beautiful doubly branching structure. And there's nothing else that we can think of which would make that except something that was growing on the bottom of the ocean. So perhaps the ancient stromatolites were formed by microbes like the ones that build these structures today. These big stromatolites are composed mostly of rock at the bottom, and the only living part of the stromatolite is a thin layer on top. And that thin layer on top is made up of microscopic blue-green bacteria called cyanobacteria. Named after the blue-green color of their cells, these cyanobacteria use photosynthesis to collect energy from the sun. They secrete a sticky coating to shield them from ultraviolet radiation. As tiny pieces of dust and sediment settle on top of the sticky cells, the bacteria migrate closer to the surface to reach the light. The layers of sediment build up by about a half a millimeter a year. These structures contain living microbes, just as they have for thousands of years. The amazing thing about these stromatolites is that the microorganisms which build them are so tiny. And the structures that you see around me, compared to their size, are enormous. It would be like if humans made a skyscraper that was 105 kilometers high by 70 kilometers across. These are massive structures for the size of the organisms that make them. Many different shapes and sizes of what appear to be fossilized stromatolites have been found in the rock. It seems likely that these structures were formed by some type of microbe living on the early Earth perhaps even by the ancestors of today's cyanobacteria. We're looking at sort of a cross-section through the top of these cones and the layers that were laid down year after year. And the fact that they're all different sizes on this one surface shows that there was a colony of microorganisms growing on this one bedding plane. And that's really fascinating because it means that life evolved on this planet very early and very fast. And it's the cyanobacteria that would bring about the most astounding change in Earth's history. A change that could have started as early as three and a half billion years ago. Over time, stromatolites would spread out across the planet. As a byproduct of photosynthesis, the ancient bacteria produced a waste gas, oxygen. The oxygen was absorbed into the oceans at first. There it combined with iron erupting from undersea volcanoes to form iron oxide particles that fell to the ocean floor. Over the next several hundred million years, the planet literally rusted. There may have been other forces at work, but eventually all the iron was turned into oxide building up, layer after layer, one of the most valuable mineral deposits on Earth, iron ore. Located in Western Australia, this is one of the world's largest iron mines. The iron here was originally deposited on the floor of a primordial ocean. We're at the firing position, stop is connected. We'll fire in 10 seconds with a five second countdown. Every week they excavate a half a million tons of iron ore used to make steel for everything from cars to skyscrapers. Four, three, two, one, five.
In a more pristine state, thousands of ancient layers of iron ore are preserved in the Karajini Gorge, just 30 miles from the mine. The layers exist because different amounts of iron oxide were deposited at different times of the year. Cyanobacteria produced oxygen in varying amounts as water temperature changed with the seasons. All over the world, vast amounts of iron ore were laid down in similar ways. On our day-long clock, this process continued until one in the afternoon. <laughs> 